recent book of mine that just came out as part of this Cavallo Point project, which we've talked about, is um, interesting because it was a chance for me to put more, my more recent work in one place. And um, the Water in the West project has continued to be important. I've, I've worked on it now for huh, 30 years. <laughs> it seems like a long time. And, um, and yet I never seem to find uh, a lack of interest, a lack of important, urgent. If anything, now this is probably more important now and more um, uh, part of our culture than ever before as uh, the climate changes. And so I've reacted to and looked at um, areas that I found interesting, like this 19th century pavilion uh, in Great Salt Lake with a 20th century water slide, and it's all been flooded because of the agricultural practices of the Salt Lake. And of course, the American West is defined by its aridity, its lack of water. I, I, I married a woman from New England, and when I go back to visit my in-laws, I get very claustrophobic because, you know, you have all those trees and everything back there. And, you know, the American West looks the way it looks because there is no water. There's very little rain, and it has this kind of wide open spaces are kind of defined by, by the aridity itself. Um, and also the rainfall in the West is, as you know, very problematic. Uh, we've lived through periods, um, his, uh, historically, there have been periods of up to 30 years of no rain in California. And um, that's a little scary when you think that could happen again at any point, and there's no guarantee that we're going to have the amount of rainfall that we normally have. And with climate change, uh, who knows what's going to happen. This is a picture I call two years into a six-year drought. In the 1980s, it didn't rain for six years, and some of you may remember that. It was a little dicey, and if we have a 10-year drought or a 20-year drought, um, you know, what What's the, what are we going to do? Uh, you know, the state could begin to depopulate. It's a, it's kind of uh, terrifying in some ways to think to that, uh, but we will have to face this at some point. Um, we have wild fluctuations in the amount of, of, of moisture we get. This is my son standing in front of a snowpack on Mount Lassen in July. It was a very wet year. California has some of the heaviest snowfall in the world. It's quite interesting to know that and to see the amount of, of uh, snowpack. But of course, with global warming, the snowpack may wind up not being there, and we may wind up having uh, less water available in the summer than we're used to, and, and that actually we've become to depend on. Um, so these are images that come out of that sense of my trying to understand water. The Salton Sea is one place I've, I've spent a great deal of time, which is a fascinating source of water. But I've also looked at kind of the infrastructure of water. This is the Missouri River in North Dakota, photographing one of the dams on the Missouri that produced the Missouri River today is a series of lakes. There's not really a river that flows in the traditional sense um, because of all the dams there. What does that mean and the infrastructure? Here's a hot springs in Colorado I photographed um, several years ago. These are Indian fishing platforms on the Deschutes River in central uh, Oregon. Um, and of course, the use of irrigation in the West is a very problematic. The Imperial Valley down near the Mexican border is a classic case of a, uh, agriculture produced entirely by irrigation. There's hardly any uh, traditional agricultural practice there. And you could ask the question, and I often do when I'm driving around, why are we planting grapes? All over California, if you travel now, you'll see this, vineyards everywhere. And of course, obviously, people can make money off of that. But uh, is that the right uses of our, uh, of our resources? Or why are we planting cotton? This is my son holding some cotton in the San Joaquin Valley. There's a glut of cotton on the world market today. Should we be subsidizing uh, um, planting uh, that, that, that is uh, so cotton intensive? And looking at some of the other sources of water, this in Wyoming, in, in the Yellowstone National Park, or Lake Tahoe, or even out in the desert, seeing examples of, of uh, water in arid areas is also of interest to me. But things like mining, the mining, mining industry in Colorado, this is a, or the remnant of what was a mining uranium uh, uh, boom in the 1950s during the period of, of the uh, development of the bomb. And then the aftermath, this is where the atomic bomb actually was partly developed up in the Hanford Reach up in Washington, central Washington. It's also where there's a lot of agriculture, and it's also where there is the last endangered 
uh, wild salmon uh, that spawns in this area. So you have all three of these um, activities going on in this one, one place. And this is a radioactive pond in central Colorado. Um, my wife and I were married in 1983, and we spent our honeymoon visiting the toxic waste sites of the American West. <laughs> It was very romantic. We had a great time. And this was one of the honeymoon photographs that I took um, in Colorado, mine tailings. Um, and Straight River in Colorado, again, kind of altered landscape. But why, again, are we building uh, quarries on the top of things like the Tulare liver, or, uh, River in the San Joaquin Valley? This is, a, again, questions, uh, things that often I, I just don't understand why these things happen. Or the San Joaquin River itself, which now flows backwards from its original uh, direction. Um, there's a lot of effort to try to mitigate and change what we've done to the San Joaquin, but essentially we've dried it up and we've just destroyed the salmon run, traditional salmon runs that were there. Sometimes my wanderings in looking at water take me in interesting places. This is out in way in eastern Oregon, kind of five miles down a dirt road. There's a little sign that said spa, so I drove down this bumpy road. And, and this building was out in the middle of nowhere, and this poked my head inside, and this couple was there, and they were taking the waters. The guy had a bad lake, and we had about an hour-long conversation, and and then I took this picture. So sometimes the pictures just come out of that serendipity. And here's my uh, wife and our son standing underneath the Owens Valley water. Some of you may have seen the movie Chinatown. You know the story of the Owens Valley water wars in the 1920s. If you go to the Owens Valley today, it's a pretty dry place, which has a big pipe going through it on the left. And much of that water goes to LA on the right. Um, and of course, that water war of the Owens Valley in the 1920s is being repeated today in Nevada with the city of Las Vegas taking the role of taking the water from rural parts of Nevada. You see signs traveling around rural Nevada that are uh, kind of bring attention to this, and it's very sad. And it's, a lot of it is just the privatization, too, of the West. This is a picture in Lake Tahoe of a, a beautiful uh, part of the eastern part of the lake with a private property sign. And also that we've become increasingly dependent on water as a commodity. I mean, I think this is a mistake. I think water should be a basic right. Clean water and, uh, should be something that is part of the commons, and uh, yet we're now beginning to see more of this. And then finally, I wound up spending one part of a summer up on the Klamath River up in Northern California and Oregon, um, photographing the uh, tribal people there that are battling and trying to bring down four big dams that were built up there. And they've actually, uh, they may succeed. It, it's looking, actually, this may be a success story that the Klamath people, uh, tribal people may be able to get um, the farmers uh, that are using the river water from the Klamath River, river to, um, to be able to give some of it up so that the salmon uh, may live, the salmon that they depend on for their their culture.